Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builder's Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Welcome back to the World Builder's Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram, and let's jump right into Planet Side Geography. Now, I'm a huge fan of Planet Side Geography. I'm a, I'm a map geek, and you're going to see a lot of that in the next episode. But here, when we're talking about the actual physical geography of the planet, now, in world building, you're really dealing with three kinds of geography. You know, the geography of places, the geography of people, and how they, how they integrate to each other. And that's really, to me, the fundamental of, of what world building really is, is these three ge- geographies being combined into one thing. And you can get more specific if you want to. You can get into ge- geology. Um, and there's some interesting things you can do with that, but I'll be getting into stuff like that much later on. Today we're going to talk about the basics of geography on a planet. And this isn't meant to be an all-encompassing lesson on the geography of Earth and the types of landforms, but it's important to understand. One, and we talked about this a little before, oceans, big bodies of water. Typically, in most worlds with life, they're going to surround land. But you might get in a situation if you want a low water planet where it's going to invert. However, the less water you have, the less life you can sustain. And now on the land. The land, the land's work is really interesting because first you have, you have this idea of plate tectonics. How, how the, um, world moves, rips apart and slams together over, uh, supposedly billions of years. And you can kind of see it like if you're from the East Coast like me, um, there's a mountain range and it looks like you can map it right up with Northern Europe and Scandinavia. And it was at some point, you know, South America used to be shoved in to Africa. And you can kind of see on a map, just looking at the two, where it came apart. And the geology is very similar. There are fossils that exist on both sides of the ocean from millions of years ago that are on both sides of the ocean, but the things couldn't swim. And they used to think there are these land bridges. But then I think it was back in the 20s or 30s, someone came up with the idea of plate tectonics. Plates are very exciting. So when you, when you know about the plate tectonics and, and your continents moving, you can move right into where your coastlines are. And your coastlines are where the land's been pushed up so far underneath that it ri- rises above the surface. And it's where the surface of the land meets the water. And this is an important concept because this is where the dry land begins and the ocean ends. And inside there, you might have lakes and seas which are really just bodies of water that have been cut off from the rest of the ocean but reside there. Maybe they get replenished from rainfall. Maybe they're over time going away. Like There are areas of Earth where they found where there used to be seas and there used to be lakes and rivers and they dry out over time. But you can tell from the kind of fossils found in them that there used to actually be water there. Most of these things aren't going to impact a story because they take place over such a vast period of time. But it would be interesting if you were in a time travel for a planet and you move somewhere. If you move somewhere where there isn't land, what happens? You fall in the water. So it could play a bit in the story. I don't get crazy into plate tectonics. Once I develop the way I want my world to look, that's the way it's going to stay for all of the storytelling of the world. Because this is going to take place over thousands of years probably. It's not going to move that much to make a huge difference. It really takes millions of years to have impact. But mountains are the consequence of plate tectonics. And they kind of get smashed up when two continental plates hit. And it will will thrust up large mounds of dirt straight up in the sky and rocks. Sometimes volcanoes will be able to escape from there as well, too. But it's just much higher up. Then they get really high. And when they're new, they're very jagged. They're very rough, towering things. But with wind and water erosion, they slowly get eaten down over time. So... If you're familiar with North America at all, compare the Rockies to the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains are much older. They're much closer to Earth. That's what makes them smaller. They're smoother mountains. I'm sure a lot of people from the Rockies would say they're not even really mountains anymore. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. 
it's it's all a distinction of of you know what some geographer says. But the idea is taller, rockier, more impassable mountains become an impasse in your world too. So there's a couple things that make it important. Valleys are very connected within mountain ranges. So if you go to some place on the East Coast, like uh, where Scranton is, to take a page from every politician from the last three elections, there's a, a long valley that goes up there. And one of the interesting things are people are more likely to date someone in the same valley that they live in even today, than someone one valley over, even if the distance is shorter to get there. Why? It's just more natural to drive down the valleys. The valleys are closer to the rivers. Uh, that's usually where the more the more farmable land is and the more desirable land. Sometimes people will build higher up because you get a better view, but that becomes more of a luxury user. Now, you will see cultures being drawn to certain places based off of their need, their value for resources. And then you have to deal with how are they going to survive? What becomes important to them? And I have one culture that I'm going to get into later that lives up high up in towering mountains. But when I do that, I'll actually talk about some of what's important to them and why they do what they do, even though they they actually know it makes their life harder. But they still do it anyway because they're driven by the cultural norms to do so. From there, when mountains erode down or if it's not close to thing, you're more likely to, do, to get uh, plains or steppes, uh, and they're just more flatlands. You know, they might even be grasslands if they're a bit more fertile, but they're just areas that are more flat. But the thing you have to remember is very rarely is flat following the curvature of the planet. There are always going to be some hills and, and things that extrude. Any of those things could be meaningful to a culture around it. And if they become really pronounced, let's say like if you go out into the southwest, we have the, this river that has cut through so deeply into the Earth's crust, you get the Grand Canyon. That had to be meaningful for all of the cultures that were around there because it's this immense, just cut right into the Earth. Or the Rift Valley in Africa, you know, a much bigger example, which at parts you might not even be able to see the other side. I'm not sure, but this thing is gigantic. And it's really a plate takes t- a plate, two plates that are moving and one's being ripped off. So part of Africa is being ripped off because it's on a different tectonic plate than the rest of Africa. So as it's being torn away, it's literally ripping the earth apart. And at some point, it will it will just flood with water and it will become an ocean wave. And that part of Africa to the other side will be an island. And it might crash in somewhere else, much like India did into Asia, because those are, once again, two different tectonic plates. And you get the Himalayas that come out of that because India is pushing under Asia and shoving up the Himalayan mountains. Rivers are a place, if you look at Earth, where most what we consider civilizations form at. And that's because farming is easy in valleys, or at least easier than in other places. You can, you can irrigate water out. Now, there are some negative side effects to think about. Um, and this is what I always think about when I think of a river culture. How often and how predictable are the floods? And the best example, and I learned this in college, in college geography, if you look at Egypt, you have the Nile River. Before they put that big dam in that stopped up the Nile River and, and sort of controlled the flooding, basically after the harvest every year, you have the Nile River basin just fill in with water. And so the effect of that was the silt from the river would get pushed up on the banks and the Nile has very, very, or at least it did, had very, very fertile farming land. That's the reason why Alexander went there. That's the reason why Egypt was so powerful before that. That's the reason why Rome conquered it. The Persians attacked them. They kept getting attacked throughout antiquity. Sometimes they won, sometimes they lost. But it was because of the very fertile land that was caused by this predictable flooding. And the other good thing was, it was predictable. It always came after the harvest, if I remember correctly. Well, I'm sure not always, but almost every time. So what happened is you'd harvest your your food, you'd go away to celebrate, and it would flood over and that was the Nile giving birth. And that's probably why the Nile was so revered in a positive way by Egypt was because it was a life giver because it replenished the soil for them. Where if you go to Mesopotamia, they have two pretty big rivers over there too, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Those rivers could erratically flood any time of the year. You'd have your, your normal rain uh, or snow melting in the mountains further back towards Turkey and um, 
in the corner of Syria, Turkey, and Iran, where those would form up, and those would melt and come down and, and cause flooding in the spring. But just because of the, the geographical conditions, some differences in the way it's laid out, the flooding could be erratic. So right in the middle of the summer, you might have a flood. It wipes out your crops. What does your city state, what does your early civilization do when you have a population, let's say, I'm making up a number of 10,000 people, and all of your crops are wiped out? You might have a store, um, but what happens if that gets wiped out? But if it doesn't, you're fine. You go into your store, you eat. Or maybe you don't anyway. Maybe you take the same consequence. When you get hungry, you do bad things. And you'll do bad things very, very quickly when you're hungry. This will cause wars. And you'll start getting visions from fake gods or maybe even real gods saying, go attack that city-state next door because they're evil. And you listen to it because you are starving. And the hungry you are, you will do erratic things to become fed. And then being human... You will try and rationalize those through religion or just that's the way things are. But you'll try and cope with it afterwards because the more important thing from an evolutionary standpoint is survival. So you go attack them when you flood. So flooding and rivers are very, very important. And the same thing with lakes. Lakes don't get there by accident. If they're not fed from a river, that is usually indicated that they're either dissolving away over time, they're getting smaller, smaller, smaller. And probably after en- enough of it, they start gaining salt because the, the ratio of, of sodium to water starts to get out of balance. So something like the Dead Sea, which has been getting smaller and smaller for a long time, has a very, very dense concentration of salt. There could be a natural spring underneath it, or it could be just the way it works that there's the rivers, ra- the mountains are so rugged, there aren't really rivers formed because the stone is too hard. and why, takes, why the rivers are still being formed, why that soft ground is being uh, sought out, if you get too much water and not enough riverbeds, you will have flooding. And once the flooding goes, it's going to go downhill to the hole, which will be the lake. So it can make for a potentially erratic season. You have something that you could have anywhere in steppes or or maybe deserts anywhere. You have these, these things I call wadis, and they're essentially the ground looks level, but it's kind of like trench works. And a lot of times wadis are dry, and they're really dry ways for water to run off. It's happened for a long time. That's why they're there. But it only happens, it's only used when it's needed. So these wadis might be a good defensive position, but you don't want to build your homes in wadis because when the rain comes, it follows gravity to the lowest possible point as quickly as possible. And over time, it will cut its way through dirt, creating a river. And along that, it'll create wadis at certain parts of it, or maybe out in the in the center of a continent somewhere. It might do the same thing, but it's just hot enough that it will evaporate before it gets to where it needs to go. So you can have these wadis in sort of erratic locations. They're sort of neat from a visual standpoint because it looks kind of flat, but there's really a bunch of holes and trenches, maybe like a trench network in World War I, but was made by water just trying to get lower. A lot of soft dirt for it to go through. And now the last most important thing are natural wonders. I'm not going to go into a lot of this. Again, I talked about this in a couple of episodes ago. So I'm not going to talk much about natural wonders, but these big things left by nature, giant waterfalls, canyons, mountains by themselves, volcanoes by themselves, volcanoes in general, if they're close to a culture, um, the more wondrous they are, the more they stick out from what is known, from what else is around the more relevance they're going to have to local cultures. And when people visit those local cultures, they're going to be more likely to notice and be taken aback. And that's why the Grand King is a natural wonder. The Connecticut River is not. It's just another river. It's a bigger river, but still, it's no wonder. Not like the Nile is really long, the Mississippi is really long. Connecticut River is a deep channel river, so there's a use to it, but it's, it's not as impressive as you look at a giant river. The rain is basic. You need to know the basic geography, the world-building task for the day. And you know, before I had you create a basic map of your world, create another geography, another world. Very quickly, just a rough outline. Do it on paper. Sketch out continents. Sketch out mountain ranges. And then set it next year's and and reevaluate it by yours to this new one to Earth. And say Earth looks the most screwed up. It's the most correct. The simple fact is, 
there's more we don't know than we do know when it comes to climate and geography, I think, still at this point. The exceptions are the interesting things, you know, whether they're in people or they're in geography. So look at it, and if your geography makes too much sense, it's probably not good. If it makes no sense at all, like you have massive rivers coming both sides down a very narrow mountain range, that probably doesn't make sense either, unless you can explain it through weather patterns. But where rain comes in, it dissipates and it goes away, other areas are going to be dry. So, you know, you need your dry areas, you need your wet areas, and some areas are are, are just going to be more, more blessed than others with water. And this will have a huge impact when we start integrating cultures into geography later on. The real world task for the day is go to your bookshelf, pick out any book that you have on art, just one, and go through it. And don't look for things that really blow your mind. Look for symbols that are reoccurring. So if you have a book on this ancient Roman art, what are things that you keep seeing in that art? Art does not happen by accident early on. When you're fighting to survive, art happens for a reason. It's telling you something. And you might get inspirations for your own cultures on things you want to tell through the art of them as we get closer to doing cultures later on. The tease for this episode is maps. And I'm very, very excited to talk about maps. Uh, I'm a map geek, so I'm going to save it for that episode. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com for the show notes. It'll be under podcasting. World Builders Anvil. That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high.